we move. We move constantly. Our bodies are in perpetual motion. And it's actually one of the things that define us as, as living entities, that we are constantly moving. Except right now, of course, you are forced to sit down, which may be a little bit awkward. So if you all want to stand up for just five seconds, it's fine. Yeah. Let's celebrate motion. Feels good, right? Okay, you can go back to sitting down. We move at a very basic level of a heartbeat. And in fact, there is an unbroken chain of motion that's passed on from father to mother to child, reaching back all the way in an unbroken chain to the very beginning of, of life. At least that's what I thought until I heard Dr. Waldenberger's uh, talk. So thank you very much for ruining a perfectly good point. So there can be gaps, obviously, in this, in this chain of motion, but they are quite few and far between. We all share this the idea of motion, and it defines us, even to the point that we have a special word for what happens when people stop moving. We call that death. Now, the two people that uh, brought motion into my life, my father and my mother, one day, about 13 years ago, went to a party with some friends, uh, a joyous evening, frivolity, I'm sure, and by the time they were done, they were getting a ride back home from another couple uh, who happened to have a car. And they went into that car. And at some point uh, during their ride home, they stopped moving. It was nobody's fault, really. Well, it was a poor judgment call of an elderly man on a dark and icy road in the, in the, in the northern nights. And they stopped moving. That's quite unpleasant. I've been fascinated with movement for a long, long time, and I think that the fact that we are always moving is perhaps also in some way responsible for our fascination with technologies that move, or as I like to call them, robots. So for some years I've been working with this robot and trying to understand what the nature of the robot really is and what kind of potential is attached to this kind of technology. And we like to do that by placing the robot in a lot of different um, experiences or different situations to kind of see if we shake up the, uh, the rules a little bit. What happens if you have an android sitting in the street waiting for a bus to come by? That's kind of fun. Yeah, this is a close-up of the robot. It's actually meant as a, a small informational uh, video by a couple of engineers who were working on stuff at the time. But I thought it was quite fun. Uh, so I put a little bit of music under it, and it's on YouTube, seen uh, a couple of million times, one million times by myself, trying to figure out what's going on here, because it's not uh, immediately obvious what is actually, <laughs> what is actually going on. Um, and after having been working with this kind of technology for some years now, I have uh, a very clear understanding of two things. The first thing is that there is a huge potential waiting to be realized. A huge potential in almost any walk of life that you can imagine. And the other point that's uh, crystal clear to me is, at the moment is that there is absolutely room for improvement. So here I'm actually calling to you the engineers of the future, the entrepreneurs of the future, seize this moment, seize the golden lock of Kairos because he's running at you at high speed. And there is uh, not one, but a gazillion golden opportunities waiting in this area to enhance life of many, many people. So I'm actually envisioning a situation uh, looking ahead where we will be living, working, and playing with robots. Not just the humanoid robots. Here is another example from some colleagues. A little robotic seal. It doesn't look like very much, but has a few sensors, and you, if you touch it, it'll respond to you. And for some strange reason, it has turned out that this little pet thing is really, really useful in the treatment of persons with dementia. And there are a number of stories of uh, these people being locked away in their darkness. Um, without any ability to communicate. And once they are giving the small robot and they start playing with it, 
they're actually regaining the ability to speak and to communicate. We don't fully understand why yet, but it's an amazing result that something as, well, simple as that can actually draw people back from that kind of darkness that most of us really, really fear, ending up in. Here is another example of something similar. The little telenoid, which is a remotely controlled robot that you can use as a stand-in. This is also being deployed in the areas of treatment of dementia. And again, has some interesting properties that allows people to start communicating again. And what possibly can be better than giving this gift back to, back to people? We like to play around in my lab. This is an example of that. We put the robot in front of a class of freshman students. And I was sitting in my office, remotely controlling everything that was going on and giving a lecture through the robot. And surprisingly, when we looked at the data afterwards, we, we understood that a fairly large number of students did not realize it was a robot until the break. So they're actually sitting there for 45 minutes, not understanding that it was a robot in front of them. And that taught us a lot of things. It taught us that we are actually able to work with the situation, work with the uh, environment, work with the authenticity of the communication in such a way that it, it becomes really meaningful to have a robot in that situation. And I've been approached by a lot of people uh, who have to drive back and forth to, uh, to teach and to do other things. Say, Can I please borrow your robot? I don't care what it looks like. I, I just, I'm tired of driving back and forth. So let's do that. And of course, it has also inspired a lot of jokes about teachers at Oboe University, as you can probably imagine. In order to overcome um, some of the barriers, there are a couple of areas. This is where the, uh, the improvements come in. We need to really engage in this discussion about the Frankenstein syndrome. We need to come over somehow this fear we have of the machines taking over. Because the machines that we are building here they're doing what we are telling them to do. So really the fear is that we are terrified that our own actions will kick us in, in the head somehow. If there is a ghost in the machine somewhere, it's because we put it there. And once we overcome that kind of fear and start thinking about how we can live together with these things, to me at least, it becomes very apparent that we can actually enhance life for a lot of people in a number of situations using this technology. Now, the interesting point here is that the answer to these big questions that we are facing today is not going to be technology, or it's not going to come from technology. But the answers to these really big issues that we are facing today will come through technology as we use that in order to enhance life and life conditions around us in the world. And sometimes it becomes imperative that we stand back and start thinking uh, in a new way. This little video here is from an exhibition. A couple of uh, established uh, artists asked if they could borrow the robot for an art exhibition. So in this uh, position, we programmed the robot to be meditating. He is sitting, watching a computer screen with close-up um, close images of computer chips which I thought was really nice, being delivered by a hand-built uh, Nepalese uh, uh, PC. Um, and he's sitting there meditating. When I see this clip again, I'm reminded that sometimes we need to stop, step a little back, and reflect on what it actually is that we are doing. So for instance, even as I'm standing here and talking to you, there are people who are banging on the borders of Europe. Some of them are affluent, some of them are opportunistic, some of them are poor, but all of them are running away from the place where they really want to be. And we are witnessing in these days, these weeks, a chaos across the continent that we have not seen in many, many, many years. And if we see all these people running to us and know that they are fleeing from poverty, from famine, from the atrocities of war, is it really fair for us to spend days doing this, talking about technology, education, and design? And my answer is yes. This is actually crucially important that we do that, because it is through technology. 
and it is through education, and it is through design that we can enhance living conditions for people where they come from, so that one day they do not have to run around on the highways of, of, of Europe, but can actually go back to living where they came from, from the place that they call home. I think this is the first, uh, the, a world first, this is the first Android selfie uh, in the world. Uh, we like to have a little fun at, uh, at the office, that makes everything much more unbearable. This is another uh, fun event uh, when we had some friends over, it's always nice to have friends over, right? Yeah. Uh, in this case it was a blind robot with uh, tentacle-like fingers trying to figure out what's in front of it. And it reminds me about the true purpose of many robots. We should use robots to communicate with other robots in that language that they only they understand. And we should free ourselves of, of being so caught up in interfaces with, with the machine world, because we're not that good at it. Let the machines talk to each other and let us continue to be what we do best, and that is to make sense of the world that we are inhabiting. So, right now, the robot is sitting back at the office, slightly moving, my email is an auto-reply, and I'm free to go. Let the machine talk to the machines. And in fact, most of the emails that will reach me uh, are written by other robots anyway. So, it only, that only seems fair. This is an example of technology that's going to be hugely influential and very, very important for a number of reasons. So, the exoskeleton thing is something that has grown out largely in, in the uh, defense industries. And it's uh, probably very useful uh, to have that kind of equipment if you're a soldier. And, but sometimes I'm standing in my garden and, you know, digging in the, in the autumn, and it's heavy work, and I'm thinking, do I really have to join an army to get this kind of technology? Why can't I have it here now where I need it? These things are now widely used in rehabilitation, which is a really cool thing, but they're also useful for many other things like construction work or people working on the roads and so on. Let's have much, much more of that kind of stuff. Let's make it available. The idea here is simply to take technology that's already present, come up with new and exciting ways of using it, and by doing so, changing a lot of stuff for a lot of people. You know what really kills the conversation in this instance? Please turn off all your electronic equipment during taxi startup. <laughs> that is really, a, that's a, that is truly a conversation killer. We need to reform some of our laws around us. We need to rethink and reconceptualize the way that we think about technology. Because autonomous technologies are coming at a fast rate, and if we do it right, it's going to be a bright future in that, uh, in that sense. But only if we can get our heads around this in a way that allows us to utilize the potential. So let's bang on some doors and have people actually rewriting the rules that are right now hindering us in realizing this potential. I, th I feel that's quite important. Working with robots is a fun thing. And it reminds me of a number of things that, um, that are really important to us as people. We sometimes think of robots as machines that are really good at repeating work, repeating special motions. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but there are some kinds of repetitions that you really don't want to have in the hands of a robot. Let me give you an example. For 15 years, every day at dinner time, I've been asking the same question. And that's not a very efficient way of spending your time. 15 years, the same question every day. How was school? How was high school? How was university? How was work? And in this kind of situation, it's actually important that it's me doing the repetition. So we need to think about, quite clearly, in which cases do we want to have machines to take over this kind of, of uh, repetitious work. There are other cases, stuff that I've been doing year in, year out, like doing homework, uh, running through the same math exercises for now the third time, well, the fourth time, because I did it to myself many, many years ago. And it's not getting any better. I would love to have a robot doing that. But let's please be careful about where we put them and for what purpose. Precisely in the education industry, there is a huge um, potential here. Every teacher I know 
keep screaming about the same things. The mantra is, we need to start, stop treating everybody as just one gray mass and be individualized in our approaches to, to education. And when they're done screaming that mantra, they return to a situation where they talk about uh, where they're standing in front of a lot of people and, and talking uh, in, the, in the same voices they've always done. The problem is that none of us have the funding or the, uh, or the energy to put all the eyes and all the hands that we need into these classrooms. But the solution here clearly is let's build more hands. Let's build more eyes. Let's build more pointing fingers that can point to whatever part of the math problem you, that you're currently occupied with. Let's build that. And let's take all that training, all the exercising, and leave it in the hands of machines who are truly wonderful at doing these repetitive tasks. There's a big potential and there is a, a number of, of business models just waiting. They are open, the technology is ready. It's yours for the grasping. Take these things, let, com let us combine them in new ways. Talk to me about it, talk to some other people about it, and let's get moving. Coffee break. Yeah, that's nice. Here is another example, the drone industry. Yes, drones can be used to carry bombs, and they can be used to spy on your neighbor. But they can also do a lot of other things. They can go places where we can't really go. Surveillance of crops, surveillance of protected areas, coastal regions. Uh, not just the flying ones, but the submersibles too. There's a growing industry of building autonomous submarine vehicles that can be used to detect pollution and other things uh, below the surface. Imagine if you're walking across, uh, let's say, a football field. You have a very uh, nice overview of what's going on. There's a patch here. It's a little bit different in color. There's some disease problems over here. And you easily have that kind of, of overview. But imagine you have to go through the same football field doing that kind of work, only you're just one centimeter high. Now that makes the task almost impossible. And that is precisely how most uh, farmers feel when they're walking through their fields. It's like being this tall and walking across a huge area trying to get a grasp of what's going on. Technology is there. But what we need is new kinds of legislation that makes this um, more feasible. And we need new models to come up with how to deal with all this information. And so much of that stuff is not there yet. There's a whole world of business opportunities waiting here. The technology is ready. Are you ready? I wonder. Let's move. Finally, when I grow old, I want to go to parties too. And I want to do it in a car like this. Well, maybe not that precise model, but I want to do this in an autonomous car that drives itself. No more silly mistakes of poor judgment on a dark and icy road, because those can easily be avoided if we have the right legislation around it and if we have the right people to come up with the right models of doing this. And like my parents, I will be sitting in the back seat Music still, still loud and ringing in my ears. I'll be cracking jokes, because that's what I do when I'm at parties. Sarcasm runs really deep in this family. Hopefully, like they were, I will be sitting there, waiting to get home, holding the hand of the woman that I've spent half a life loving. And these things are possible, because technology is there. Let's share that future, let's build it, and let's make it really good. Thank you.